past. Um, and this creates a threat in the sense of loss of income. So individuals and entrepreneurs have to increase their economic efforts, they have to invest, they have to uh, invest in R&D. And on the level of the states, um, the, the risk of unemployment creates a threat to the stability of social security systems. So we see all these growth policies, we see all this investment horizon 2020, incentives for growth, etc. Um, although, as we discussed, um, this, may, uh, this increasing economic activity may create or creates uh, some fundamental problems um, for ecological stability. So I try to turn these things into a model in order to like convince other economists that there may be uh, uh, something interesting to study and also to um, to get maybe out of this dilemma. And the necessary ingredients are surely something like endogenous resource-driven technical change, so which was presented by uh, Rainer Kömel four years ago here in Les Uches. The investment, also I think endogenous credit creation and all this relation to banking, uh, money, etc., are important as uh, Gael Giraud presented four years ago. Um, we, sim we need something such as unemployment, we also need income heterogeneity, so where do resource rents end up, etc. So I think there is not really a sense in making such a model with uh, one representative agent. We may want to integrate something such as conspicuous consumption, so this uh, fact that we uh, relate ourselves, our consumption patterns to, that we compare it to other persons. So we cannot simply assume that all the utility functions of the agents are purely selfish, that they only look at the sel the, um, themselves. And if we want to describe something as a social dilemma, well, we have the need, <laughs> yeah, we have to ne the need to integrate these dilemmata into our economic model. And I guess it's important then to describe, to be able to describe the dynamics also out of equilibrium. Well, if we look at the current state of economic modeling, or at least what 95% of uh, macroeconomic models consist of, we see ingredients such as market clearing. We may have some stochastic shocks in these GE models, but no like fundamental uncertainty, no instabilities, no coordination failures. We often lack out of equilibrium foundations at all um, and multi multiple equilibria or we have some out of equilibrium foundations but only like a fixed a stable path and then we have some uh, um, derivations from that in, in Taylor approximation. And we usually have no dynamics of money and credit so we assume that at least in the long run um, all this is neutral and it's just reflecting um, the real economic activity. And it's solely based on rational behavior, so uh, the optimization of a certain utility function. Um, so the problem with these behavioral assumptions is that it requires, the application of a general equilibrium model requires the constrained optimization, so you have some constraints, production functions, etc., of some master utility function. So if you do optimization, you can only optimize one single function. You cannot optimize 10. So you have these numerous constraints, as I said, budget constraints, zero profit equilibrium, for example. And then you assume that you can jump to the utility top. That's what Yves Brechet said. It's set the tangent on the Pareto set. The constraints set the Pareto set. So what can we achieve? And then we have to decide, um, following some optimization procedure, where we actually go to, where we can jump, how high we can get on our way to uh, the utility Mont Blanc, you could say. And agents in these models are able to correctly anticipate all these constraints from now until the future, which is, I mean, quite optimistic, I think. And the invisible hand uh, cannot create any dilemma there. So if you do this optimization procedure, it's impossible that all people are worse off in the end in this kind of model. I mean, obviously, these models are set up in a way that you can actually solve them. So it's also like mathematical convenience that was behind uh, all these, all this idea. But the problem, or one of the problems related to that, is that this aggregation of individual behavior, of individual utility functions, to some master utility function that describes the behavior of the total economy has to be possible. And it has been shown that this is possible only under very restrictive macroscopic assumptions, such as it doesn't matter whether you give 10 euros to me 
or to Bill Gates, we will do them the same thing, which is not related to individual optimization, which I may even accept, but it's related to macroscopic restrictions on the things that people can actually do. And this is reflected in this representative agent's assumption, but you rarely, it's rarely discussed this problem that was raised in the beginning of the 1970s by De Brue, Mantel and Sonnenschein, and there are excellent papers by Alan Kerman, for example, that is um, uh, discussing this problem. Um, so this problem of aggregation is rarely discussed. But the problem is that equilibrium models are rather worthless if these conditions do not hold. So if you cannot aggregate, then you cannot solve them because then you have multiple, um, multiple equations or multiple optimization strategies that do not necessarily fit to each other. You don't get a unique equilibrium, etc. So the question then is, how do market forces, how do all this interaction works out of equilibrium? And for me, it was interesting then to go back into the like foundations of neoclassical economics, so which started in the end of the 19th century, and to see, and this is, I mean, I'm a physicist, so I was uh, maybe also interested <laughs> uh, in particular, in these historical analogies um, between mechanics, as uh, you said, uh, Eric, in the, last, uh, in the last presentation, like Valra said, uh, um, economics is essentially mechanics, and uh, uh, Irving Fisher and Wilfredo Pareto were even stronger in this. They even had concordance tables, physics, economics, so how do they relate to each other? And um, equilibrium was described as the stationary states of mechanical systems. And if we look at the time evolution now, so the, the Newtonian equations were developed in 1686. Then we have constraint dynamics, which was Lagrange 100 years later. And in economics, you see in 1838, Cournot um, with the first like optimization strategy, anticipation of the erection of other people, etc. We ha have the early neoclassicals, so Valra, but then later Jevons, uh, um, Fisher, Pareto that developed the idea of general equilibrium. And then finally, Arrow and De Brue in, in, 44, uh, in 54 realized to implement general equilibrium as some optimization under constraint. And the question is, for me, it was interesting to see, well, Lagrange, he described something such as constraint dynamics. So we have all these constraint in economics. So how can we like, make a dynamic model that reflects the ideas that were brought up by, um, by these people? And that's how I want to proceed. So I'm not talking about analogies between thermodynamics and <laughs> economics, but rather between Lagrangian mechanics and economics. And m f maybe it's interesting for you to know that if you have dynamic equilibrium models, they usually describe something a physicist would call a quasi-static process. So the system is at equilibrium at every point between its initial and final state. So this is, well, what I would call quasi-static, or what Barry called quasi-static. But for these early neoclassicals, I mean, in particular, Pareto is very explicit about that. It did dynamics did not mean this intertemporal equilibrium, but this adaptive process of convergence to some stationary state. And the convergence to the state that he analyzed in static theory. But he said, well, he didn't get far with that. And Leon Hufford said, very little has been done to address. He says it's an unfinished business of the old and classical theory. So let's see if we can contribute at least a small bit um, to this unfinished business. And I, there were lots of claims arguing that general equilibrium is inspired by physics. But as I, s as I or as you know, probably, or at least the physicists among you will know, the Lagrangian mechanics is like a concept of, uh, it describes the dynamics of interacting particles under constraints. And we have some conserved quantities, such as energy, etc. So I would argue that if Newton was an economist, he would probably have used something like stock flow consistent, yeah, the sto conserved quantities, etc. Agent-based models, and not some general equilibrium approach. But well, I mean, um, I wasn't able to ask him. The idea is how can we extend these analogies between economics and mechanics from constraint optimization to constraint dynamics? And the idea. At least, I mean, the physicists among you will know that we can model the dynamics of the stocks and flows in an economic model. So goods, financial assets, material, energy, etc., and their restrictions. So this is consistency, essentially. So that you cannot create energy out of thin air, 
that you can create money out of thin air, but only if you have like a asset and a liability appearing at the same time. And so we know from physics, uh, here we see this is an example with the cars on the track, that we have a combination of some accelerating force, and then we have the constraint force that is created by the track in order to keep the car on track. So this is the concept that we will use to guarantee these restrictions, so this consistency, that the uh, relations that we want to be uh, guaranteed are in fact guaranteed. So we transfer this concept to economic models. And in fact, so we see <laughs> another small uh, uh, concordance table between mechanics and economics. In, 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 economics, uh, in, in mechanics you have this like simple Newtonian equation that the change of the velocity is one over, one over mass times the forces that are, um, that are applied. So, and this includes also the constraint forces. Okay, so this is Newtonian mechanics, it's not, not a surprise. And in economics, we have like a diversity of variables such as stocks, flows and prices. We have forces, I mean you know the term market forces in economics, but there's no like definition of that. You don't even have like what does it really mean? So we try to formalize that. And we have the constraint forces that are guaranteed or that are there to guarantee um, all the identities that we have in economic models that has to be fulfilled. And related to mass, we introduce a term we call economic power. And as you, ca as you can see here, if you have a high mass, then a, a force leads only to a small change in the velocity. And in economics, if you have forces that reflect the desire to change a certain variable, you multiply that with this factor mu we call economic power, which is the ability to control a variable. So if you have a uh, huge interest in becoming rich, but you're not able to change anything in the economic system, your force, your desire, which is reflected by this force F, will not have any impact. So this is a way of formalizing the idea who is able to influence a certain variable. So who can actually control it? And I mean, this is a debate between different eco schools of economic thought, who's able to control the interest rate? Is it the market? Is it the central bank, for example? Ah. No, I mean, if you have, um, I mean, it's not, uh, you also see that uh, this mu is, uh, is not independent on the forces. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's simply, I mean, I think it's more plausible to see like a big economic power creates a big change of a variable. So therefore, uh, so therefore we like mu con uh, uh, corresponds to one over m. I mean, in, in, in the end, although there is a relation, it's still an economic model. So I, it's, it's just to, for you to make it easier maybe to transfer your intuition you may have from mechanical systems to economic systems. So constraints in economic models restrict the phase space reachable by the variables, similar to mechanical systems. We have several of them. This may be individual budget constraints, so you cannot spend more than you get, or if you do, you have to finance it. We have production functions that may consist, uh, that may co um, consist of constraints, so there may be Leontief, as we have seen, there may be Cobb Douglas, there may be Linux, I mean, you can imagine whatever you want. But also such things that such as input-output consistency, as we've seen in the, in the talk by uh, Sandra Bouno uh, on Monday, I think, this also is a constraint on the system. You have this monetary stock flow consistency, what I would call the first law of financial economics, so everything that goes somewhere has to come from somewhere. Um, we have something like energy conservation, so the first law of thermodynamics, Rainer Kummer presented, the mass conservation, I would call it the first law of chemistry. So we see all these laws essentially consist or lead to constraints. And as I said, the constraints in our model generate constraint forces as in Lagrangian mechanics. Yes.
Well, I mean, we don't necessarily have conserved quantities such as energy conservation also in economic models. Okay, so in optimization models, we have some mass utility function under constraints that reflect the behavioral assumptions. In our approach, we may have different forces as desire to influence certain variables and this economic power as the ability to influence these. So we actually don't jump to the utility top, but we try to climb the mountain. So we don't say we are able to reach the top or to, to determine um, the optimal solution, but we try to go into the a direction that we like. So we try to increase our utility, but not necessarily optimize it as a behavioral assumption. And then we can allow for heterogeneity among consumers, among firms, etc., because we don't have this aggregation problem that we have to solve. So we don't have to kick out heterogeneity because it kills our aggregation um, possibilities. We can allow for them. And we have no equilibrium assumptions a priori, but possible convergence. So we may see this dynamics towards equilibrium. So in the end, we have a differential algebraic equation framework. We have some agents, we have a number of stocks and the corresponding flows. So because it's in continuous time, this relation between stocks and flows is trivial. We have identities, constraints. Here it's in this example, it only relates to flows, but in general, it can also relate to stocks. So these constraints are, as I said, first law of, uh, of uh, thermodynamics, the fact that accounting identities have to, has to be fulfilled, etc. We can always reformulate them in a way that they're equal to zero. And so we have a set of, uh, of constraints. And similar to mechanics, to Lagrangian mechanics, we now have like the time evolution of um, the variable is equal to the sum of all the forces uh, multiplied by the corresponding power factor. So this is essentially like all the uh, external forces in a, in a mechanical system. And then we have this, uh, this term with a Lagrangian multiplier that corresponds to the constraint force. And, um, and as you can see, well, so we, ha we have for every constraint, we have an additional Lagrangian multiplier um, that, um, that shows up in the equations. So we have more variables than the than the actual stocks and flows. Okay, I will try very simply to give you a uh, first intuition. It's not even an economic model. It's so trivial, but I think it may, it may help to understand. So this old debate about I and S, investment and saving. So in economic models, usually you argue then, okay, saving implies investment, investment implies saving, and Keynesian and neoclassical authors has discussed it for, I don't know, decades. Um, and in our model, we can simply say, um, we as a constraint, we say that um, I minus S is zero. Okay, that's our constraint. And this is depicted by this uh, 45 degree line. So let's assume we are somewhere here. Now we have some behavioral, um, behavioral functions. So we have some forces. So the people may want to increase their saving. Um, and we may have something like, uh, like investors that may want to invest. But in the end, we know that we have to stay on this line. So this is a this is a this is a constraint, and if we now take all this uh, um, all this um, uh, all this um, like if we apply this model, we can see that we have some power factor mu s multiplied by this desire to increase savings, and now we have this term and you just take the, deriv the, the, the derivative. In this case, S is a flow, so it corresponds to X dot. So we have um, this, uh, this lambda, this Lagrangian multiplier. And for I dot, do it similarly. And in fact, now you can distinguish different types of economic uh, models by setting these power factors differently. So if you're in a, a neoclassical world, where the investment is purely dependent on the saving decisions, 
then you will set this to infinity and this to zero and inversely. But in fact, you can do models where both the savers and the investors have some power to influence the dynamics of the system because then in fact you will get something like that so the constraint force will guarantee that you move along this line. Okay, have you understood this in principle? More or less. Okay, so this was the first simple example and we will do some others because I haven't finished to like make a full model as I wanted but I have like some steps toward this and this may help you to understand also um, also the um, the concept. So if you take a simple exchange model, exchange means we have a fixed quantity of two goods. Let's call this one money. This is the good, so we can have X and M. And here we have maybe Hervé, who owns a certain amount of money and a certain amount of the good. And you can see here, this is the utility ISO line. So Hervé is as happy if he's here or if he's here. Okay, fine. And Hervé wants to increase its utility, so which means that he will apply forces that are like uh, perpendicular to his utility ISO line. Okay, so let's take maybe, uh, maybe Jacques as a second one, because in, in total the quantity is fixed. So here is the origin for Jacques. And if Hervé has just that much, this means that the remaining part is left for Jacques. So we have the utility ISO line of Jacques here, and he wants to increase its utility, climb the mountain. But now we have the constraint that for every change in X, you have to give up a certain amount of money. Well, this is the price you have to pay, so you cannot cheat. And this creates then a constraint that, depending on the price, leads to a movement of this, uh, of this point in this direction. And finally, in the end, if you model it, so here you have the equations, you have the constraints that the con quantities are conserved, this is a budget constraint, you have to give up money if you want to get buy goods, we have these forces that are corresponding to the gradient of the utility functions, so we have the time evolution for x, and if you take it the in the second constraint, you can easily derive the one for m. And now we have some auction here. Uh, Eric discussed the tatonment, where you if if demand is too high, the price will increase. So we do that, but slowly. And usually in an eco in this economic model, it is assumed that the trading is stopped while the price is changed. So you adapt the price until both are happy and you end up probably somewhere here. Here you have this contract curve, so where uh, like an optim all the optimal solutions. But in our case, we adopt the price slowly. I mean, this is, I think, how reality actually m works, that um, no, no one stops trading to adjust the prices and then when the price is perfectly fine, then we re re restart uh, trading. So we do it in a way, I think, that corresponds pretty much to an intuition also of most economists. And we can model that and you can see you reach a final value, which is here, but it depends on the initial price, it, de it depends on the power of the auction to actually change the price, how fast you can actually change the price, and you reach an equilibrium value, so a stationary state, a fixed point of the system, that is then different from the one you would have obtained in the other way. So you have a pass dependency integrated there. And uh, so this is like uh, the most simple uh, exchange model where you have something like past dependencies, false trading in the sense of the price wasn't right, etc. So this can also be modeled with our framework. And here you can see that we're, although there was some intuition taken from mechanics, we're staying rather close to conventional economic models. So we really try to get something new out of these economic models that you can find in every economic textbooks. Um, and I think this is uh, um, how one should maybe proceed if one want to get, like if one want to 
um, suggest a new uh, a new um, framework. Okay, was it clear to everyone? Okay, so how much time is left? Ten. Okay, fine. Okay, so let's take a model where you have production. So the constraints here are that the production is equal to some production function. Here it's a very simple one with capital and labor. Here we assume that the total stock of capital and the total stock of labor is fixed, so it's just allocated to different sectors. Um, then we assume that firms try to increase their profits and households try to increase their utility. So the time evolution for CI, so the consumption of the household, is then determined by some factor that corresponds to the desire and the ability of the household, some factor that corresponds to the influence of the firm, so how much to produce, for example, and then we have this factor here that comes from this constraint. So this is the constraint force that guarantees that in the end the production functions the production function will be satisfied. And again we do some slow price adaptation, so if the price for capital is uh, uh, if, if the people actually demand more capital than is available, then the interest rate will rise. So this is uh, like conventional economic reasoning. And you can actually see in this case that if we start here and let it simply run, it converges essentially to the standard uh, um, equilibrium solution of neoclassical economics. So we have somehow found uh, a simple extension of the neoclassical model that can be something as an out of, uh, out of equilibrium foundation for these models. And it actually converges to the equilibrium they expect. So um, I hope they are happy now. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it allows to study this process explicitly, this process of convergence. And of course, it may be in this model it was it is obvious that it has to converge there, but you may construct models where it's not the case. So um, we'll see that later. Okay, example number four, which relates to the monetary perspective. So this is a simple stock flow consistent model from the uh, textbook of um, Winnie Godley and Marc Lavoie. So here we have some households that own some money we have the government that has actually emitted the money, so spend it into, uh, into existence. So w that's what we see here, that the saving corresponds to the income of the household minus taxes minus consumption. Okay, so if you have more income, then you actually have to pay taxes and consume. This will change your savings. And here, for the government, they have some government expenditure they get some taxes and the difference is then just spend into existence um, by money emission. So it's a very simple model of monetary economy. It's the most simple you can imagine, I think. And the production sector is just an accounting sector here. So he just sums consumption and government expenditure and this is the uh, total income to the household, so wages, profits um, together. So there's really nothing happening in this model. It's really very really, uh, trivial. But it's to sh illustrate that these stock flow consistent model, they also, this consistency of stocks and flows is nothing else than a constraint. And the behavioral functions that are used then to, to determine, for example, how much to consume given a certain income are behavioral functions. And you can transform them into forces of our model. So in the in households trying to influence these variables. And I mean, this model is a classical one where you really have disequilibrium behavior, you really see the dynamics. And usually it's modeled as a discrete dynamical system of motion under constraint, but there is nothing, di I mean, there's no problem in taking this model to continuous time and to actually put it into our modeling framework to show, and this is, I think, what is nice that you can represent models from different schools of economic thought. So this is rather a post-Keynesian model 
and a neoclassical model that you can put them together in one single modeling framework and then you decide, okay, what are the behavioral assumptions, what are the assumptions of economic power that corresponds to the solutions they expect. So neo neoclassical authors tend to assume that the price adaptation process is very, very fast. Keynesians are more critical about that uh, and think it's a slower process, but you can just um, go from one to the other by changing the parameters. And I think this is quite nice. Um, in this case of this stock flow consistent model, there is another challenge. Um, if you have n variables, so consumption, in, uh, income, saving, etc., and you have k constraints, so these accounting identities, that means that you can choose a subset of n minus k behavioral uh, functions, because if not, you have an overdetermined system. And this choice often is quite arbitrary. So they simply say um, that, uh, that households have no influence on the, the amount of labor they, they actually work. But they have to assume that, because they cannot choose n behavioral functions but only n minus k. So they have to leave some of these variables floating free. Um, so an example is something like a consumption function, where you, in this case, simply assume that it depends on income and the money you have accumulated. And then you, you have to leave other variables free. In our approach, you can specify behavioral functions for, or behavioral forces for each variable. And then you have like the additional k Lagrangian multipliers that guarantee that you don't have an overdetermined system. So you are able to do you much more flexible in terms of what does influence what. So these are the I, I think it's an advantage over the conventional stock flow consistent approach. So as an example, we take this model by Godley and Lavoie, and now we say, okay, let's assume household's utility depends on how much they consume and how much money they have, which is, I think, r rather plausible, particular for uh, like post-Keynesian assumptions. Government spending is exogenous. We have some taxing, so part of income is taxed. So the constraint, if you like reduce the, the number of equations, is simply that the non-taxed income of the households is equal to C plus M dot, so consumption plus saving. And the time evolution is then that C dot corresponds to the marginal utility, so you take the derivative of the utility function, and this corresponds to the constraint force, and the similar for the uh, for um, M dot dot. Okay, so this is the time evolution that we um, that we assume, and you can see that you can quite perfectly reproduce their model in discrete time, with our continuous time, in our continuous time framework, and we can even say, after some parameter tweaking, okay, so if you describe this time evolution, you actually assume these forces, so people are interested in owning money and consuming, and these are the power factors that you assume. So you can get new information about existing models by reproducing them in our framework. And they claimed that their modeling approach is based on something like, um, 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 like a gradual utility approach. So you're gradually improving your utility. But they simply claim it in, in their book. But we can prove that it's actually wrong, uh, that it's actually right. <laughs> so, and we can even specify the utility function for their model. So, uh, so this is, I think, uh, um, I, I haven't sent it to Marc Lavoie, but I hope he will like it. <laughs> okay, and the fifth example is a very simple biophysical model where you have some economic flows here, so the flows of money here in black. Again, you can see some, some money. Here we have also integrated interest on money. Okay, it's only a bit more complicated, and we have tracked the flows of energy, so the uh, uh, so sunlight that is then producing biomass, which is harvested and consumed and like finally ends up as, as heat in the atmosphere. So we have made a model that is consistent in its, in its ecological um, 
in its eco in the eco in ecological terms. And um, so we integrated these flows and funds of energy, such as Jureske Rögen has proposed. Our ecosystem exhibits logistic growth. So this is what we simply assumed. Um, that there is uh, that there is a limit for uh, the growth of the ecosystem, and then we can do a stability analysis and take the parameters. Um, so sometimes you see convergence to some ecological and economically um, stable system. Sometimes you see that there is essentially some convergence of the economic system, but the environmental system is degraded, and then it collapses. So the ecological system um, collapses. And then, okay, then there's nothing left to harvest. So, well, the economic system um, explodes too. And we can have really like explosive behavior um, where uh, all um, is, is killed quite quickly because the economic system uh, is also uh, exploding. Okay, so you can see from these examples that it's possible to integrate a variety of models or ideas that we have discussed at this conference and <laughs> that were discussed in, in the last decades into this economic modeling framework. So let me quickly summarize the characteristics again for you to take away. We can incorporate in our modeling approach um, behavioral assumptions that are different from optimization but are still like connected to utility functions, for example. So you can say, okay, we're not optimizing, but we're climbing the utility hill. So it's, uh, um, that's uh, then nice because you can actually reproduce um, the dynamics, uh, to the, the convergence towards equilibrium. We can relax these macroscopic assumptions about aggregation because we don't have to find one single mass utility function at the end to describe the behavior of our system. We distinguish and model the ex-ante and the ex-post dynamics. So for me, ex-ante is before the constraints are applied, ex-post is after the constraints are applied, so including the constraint forces, the market forces. We can discuss slow price adaptation out of equilibrium dynamics. We treat the stocks and flows of money, of energy, of materials, and their constraint consistently. We have formalized economic power and economic forces. and. And an advantage is that we include some well-known general equilibrium solutions as fixed points of the dynamical system. So I think a big advantage is that these different theories can be represented within one single framework. So it's still work in progress. We have formalized these things, forces, constraint forces, and economic power for models in and out of equilibrium. We can represent goods, production, money, energy, materials consistently in our model and <laughs> what is left to do <laughs> which is uh, like not quick thing is to combine them and actually apply them I mean this will be then uh, the rest of my PhD to some to the question that I've raised in the beginning namely how can we describe um, gross imperative um, this social dilemma etc within this economic framework thanks for your attention Very nice talk. Thank you very much. And uh, questions? There you will. Ah. I sit right in the back, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you did work. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the, the good talk. I guess one short question. Why do you, I guess you seem to need the, to use the idea of utility. So do you need, do you have to use that? Or, or not, it's just something you're using out of uh, um, ease and it's, it's something that we can't necessarily measure out there, what's the utility? Yeah. So you're wanting to formalize stocks and flows and resources, but still keep something that we don't know how to really count. I mean, in principle, you can define these forces as you wish. So you can take a any behavioral assumptions that you want and so the, the framework is, doesn't care um, what you do with these forces. But I think it's helpful if you want to connect this model to the discussion that has been out there in economics, it's maybe a good idea to say, well, we can also use utility functions. And in fact, as I showed in the case of the post-Keynesian model, 
often this behavioral function can just be transformed into a utility function and doesn't change anything. It's just different mathematical specification. And I think this is important to point out because there's lots of discussion about, well, you use behavioral function, we use utility function. But in fact, there's no mathematical difference. So and I think you shouldn't discuss it if it's just, uh, or you shouldn't discuss it that way if it's just a question of mathematical transformation. So, so you force is the gradient of the utility function? Yes. I mean, so in this that case, it's can integrable and it's conserved. Uh, th thank you for the talk. Um, I think the approach with Lagrange is a very good idea. Um, but uh, if you would go back one more, uh, <coughs> one more thing. No, one more. That the, the, no, the last. The la this one. Last. No, one before last. One before last is this one. No, the next one. The next, next one, one is yes. Conclusion. No, one more. That no, before that you had this one. Yeah, that's. Ah, okay. You want to see the image. That image, yes. Okay, I can make, I can take it like a bigger one. Maybe it's yeah, easier to it's read. It's then. It's um, I think the problem between physics and economics has been in the past that economists have to try to model economics according to mechanics, and you start from the same point of view. Yeah. Um, the problem is uh, that. In mechanics, you cannot tr you cannot do mechanics with friction. Uh, if you have frictional forces, frictional forces lead to heat, and you have you cannot handle that anymore. You have to change to thermodynamics, and uh, otherwise you cannot handle the system. And again, here you have the sun. And then you have heat, and you have production, and then you have heat again to the atmosphere. So this is not mechanics. This is thermodynamics. And thermodynamics also has the Lagrange function, but there the Lagrange function is the temperature. Uh, the, no, the, 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 uh, uni the utility function is the entropy, and the lambda is the temperature. So um, you see, this is a completely different meaning than you would have in mechanics. In mechanics, you don't have temperature, you don't have, uh, um, you don't have entropy. So I think uh, m but mechanics is actually thermodynamics at t equals zero. And uh, this is actually the equivalence. And uh, economic models have to be modeled according to uh, thermodynamics because both systems create. They, uh, you have profits in, in economics and you have uh, the granular generation of heat in thermodynamics and this corresponds. Uh, and only if you have no generation of heat, if you have no profits, if you have, you, c you consume what you earn, again you consume what you earn, then you can apply mechanics because mechanics conserves the energy and there's no growth. Well, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, in f I mean, in principle, you can you can describe the Newtonian mechanics of a system with with friction. I mean, you just have additional forces, but you don't describe the whole system for sure. Only one thing you can linear friction yeah. can be handled to reduce, reduce it, but already nonlinear friction you cannot handle in mechanics. It's a nonlinear equation, and this is very difficult to handle. Yeah, you cannot find an analytical solution. Yes. Yeah. And the proper way, since physicists cannot handle this nonlinear equation anymore with, uh, with, with friction, they use thermodynamics and they But I mean, we have. I mean, also, if you integrate these uh, utility functions as gradient of the, the force as uh, gradient of utility function, you also have nonlinear um, um, forces in our model. So it's impossible in our model to find analytical solutions for this. Yeah, so it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that mean, if I have well understood, that in fact you have increased the degree of freedom, the degree of liberty for each uh, economic agent in order to behave differently depending on circumstances? And in that context, uh, will it be possible with your model to introduce um, different money? one or two money in order to 
cover different uh, behavior of agent or even government with uh, in universal money for external exchanges and local money for behaving locally uh, and in order to increase the uh, uh, behavior or the type of behavior of economic agent uh, uh, or not. Well, I mean, in principle, if you introduce a second monetary system, it just adds uh, uh, constraints uh, because you can save in two different uh, things and, uh, and you have to specify more behavioral functions. But uh, it's no, I mean, it's not at all a conceptual problem. It just increases the complexity, maybe drastically, but uh, because you have to also discuss the interaction between the two monetary systems and so on. But uh, it's not a conceptual problem. Yeah. Uh, very simple question. Uh, do you have anything which looks like the conservation of energy? Uh, no. Okay. No, I mean it's... But then you can deal with friction, because friction yeah. leads yeah, you I mean to a lot of energy. Yeah. I mean, you, the you problem is that... You can do mechanics with non-conservative forces. There's nothing... Yeah, yeah we cannot. Course. What is We do it all the time. Yeah. When you use friction forces, uh, doing mechanics, because you don't care about the loss of energy. So that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, you c then you may not be able to find analytical solutions, but you don't find them anyway in these models. So, And, um, and the second uh, thing is you, don't, you cannot calculate a Lagrangian function for the system, because like it's the inverse problem of, like, of Lagrangian mechanics. And in general, you will not be able to find a Lagrangian function that describes the overall behavior. No. no, I mean, you do not create the temperature. You see, the, uh, mechanics is, is thermodynamics at T equals zero. And uh, if you have friction, friction makes heat. And heat makes temperature. So where is the temperature? Yes, this is not mechanics anymore. This is thermodynamics. No, 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 no. no. This is not mechanics. It's a way of taking some concept of mechanics, namely dynamics under constraint, to economic models. It's not mechanics anymore. And I think that's the problem. Yeah, let's take the thermodynamic model. It's almost the same, but it has instead of lambda, it has a temperature there, which you can trans transform into economics. That is the proper equation for that system. But what I mean is the approach is okay, but you have to take the right sample of this is thermodynamic model, which has a similar thing, but their temperature, the new factor of entropy, is now the utility function. Yeah, but um, I mean, uh, maybe. Uh, for me, personally, it doesn't make much sense to relate utility to an entropy function. I mean, it's something, it's, it's not even related. Uh, there is, I mean, you can see that th they can argue that there is some, uh, some mathematical correspondence, but I think you shouldn't take it too seriously because it's, it describes two concepts that are not at all related, in my opinion. Uh, I, I, have a have I have a question, and it may m make the, 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 the preceding de debate clearer. Uh, y you have agents, many agents. Uh, how many agents in, in the simulations you, sh you showed, and uh, how, could you, how many agents could you handle? Well, I mean, him and me. yeah, I mean, <laughs> in the model set you have seen, you had, how, I mean, you had, two or three or four agents. So it's, it's quite, in these examples, it's quite limited. And the problem, if you increase the number of agents, it's simply about the, um, the mathematical complexity and the mathematical stability. So if you still can yes. solve this yes. system. And I don't n really know the, the limit. But, but I guess for me, all these models are and will probably I mean, it's possible that they will only be useful and realistic in terms of modeling on a, on a basis of some agents and not on the basis of a lot of agents. Uh, coming to the end. Game, Game is over. <laughs> Thanks for all your questions. Thanks.